Okay, everything's organized. Uh, I'm now going to ask um, Myrtle, who you've all met, to introduce the next speaker, who's uh, a colleague of mine, um, Dr. Marlon German. Thank you. So in 2013, Julian and I were wondering about spreading the word. So we set off on our first ever cannabis legalization road trip, which took us via Bloemfontein down to, ca down to Cape Town and then back up the coast, stopping in at all little towns, meeting our supporters, having small gatherings. Sometimes there were only five people there. Sometimes there were hundreds. We were quite nervous and um, this was all very new to us. We had a little presentation going. Then we had a call from Tony Budden and he said, seeing as you're going to Grahamstown, there's a young doctor there who would like to meet you. Hmm. So this young doctor came and met us at our guest house and he was working at the New England Psychiatric Facility in Grahamstown, which is quite a notorious psychi psychiatric facility. Um, it's old and colonial and quite a difficult place to work. We were immediately blown away by this young man and his passion. Since 2013, Marlon, who's recently been joined by Maxine, who is our crew coordinator today, we've been on amazing journeys together. We were in New York last year for the United Nations General Assembly uh, special section on, session on drugs. Um, we've traveled to Cape Town for Drug Policy Week. Marlon, uh, earlier this year, went to California twice within six weeks to represent Fields of Green for All, both at Psychedelic Science and at the Patients Out of Time Conference in Oakley, Oakland. Uh, we have developed a really amazing bond, and this young man is here today with all of his vast knowledge to share with you about the most important subject of the day, the endocannabinoid system. Please give a big hand for Dr. Marlon German. Mm. <clears throat> <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you, Myrtle. Uh, I feel really grateful to be here talking to you today about the endocannabinoid system. Um, now, there's no formal train training in the endocannabinoid system, um, but as Keith mentioned, Dr. Rokal Peralbe from Uruguay has been assisting us to develop a training course for doctors who are interested in learning more about the, the endocannabinoid system and the field of endocannabinology, as she calls it. Um, so if there's anyone who's interested in finding out more, uh, please speak to us after this. I received my training in the endocannabinoid system from uh, travels, as Myrtle mentioned, and from attending conferences that offer CME points for learning about the endocannabinoid system. I will present to you my interpretation of the endocannabinoid system. What is it? How does it work? What, what do we have it for? What is the relevance of this system? Okay, <laughs> so in an interview last week, Frank from Special Assignment asked me to explain the endocannabinoid system as if I was explaining it to an eight-year-old. My response was, if you're watching the, a game of tennis on TV, 
the endocannabinoid system functions like everyone else on the court. The ball boys, the umpires, the linesmen, helping the players so that the game can run smoother. The, pl the players create the action potential. The assistants on the court modulate the activity. They are all considered humans, or in the case of the endocannabinoid system, they are all considered neurotransmitters. So let me refresh your memory about uh, regarding normal neurotransmission in the brain. So over here we have the pre-terminal axon. Over here we have the post-terminal axon. Inside the pre-terminal axon, you have neurotransmitters um, stored in vesicles. And what happens is an action potential runs down the axon, causes the release of the neurotransmitters, and these neurotransmitters bind to receptors on the postsynaptic terminal. If glutamate is the neurotransmitter, this causes excitation. If the neurotransmitter is GABA, this will cause inhibition. So what are cannabinoids? Cannabinoids are basically chemical compounds that act on cannabinoid receptors. They modulate and regulate the activity of the other neurotransmitters. Molecules that bind to cannabinoid receptors, we call them ligands, like a lock into a key include the, the class of endocannabinoids, which are made inside the body, uh, the phytocannabinoids, which are found in the cannabis plant, but actually also a small amount in hops and thistle, um, and synthetic cannabinoids manufactured artificially, dronabinol, marinol, sesamate, and all these varieties of cannabinoids are activators of the endocannabinoid system. So uh, how do cannabinoids work? Endocannabinoid, the endocannab what the endocannabinoid system does is it modulates neurons outside of action potentials, sending feedback so that the neurons know how many neurotransmitters to send to the synaptic cleft. Cannabinoids bind to cannabinoid receptors at the pre-terminal, at the presynaptic ter terminal, functioning to control the release of neurotransmitters in response to messages from the postsynaptic neuron. The cannabinoid receptors CB1 and CB2 are of are G protein coupled receptors. Because they are the class of G protein coupled receptors activation of the cannabinoid receptors acts on um, other channels, acts on a variety of other channels. One of those channels is the calcium channel. S um, calcium is involved in causing the release of n neurotransmitters. So if, we end so if we block calcium channels through cannabinoid signaling, we end up having less release of a neurotransmitter. If that if that neurotransmitter is GABA, we end up having less inhibition. Because cannabinoid receptors are present in both glutamatergic and GABAergic neurons, they can do both, and they do do both. So this is Professor Mashula. Um, cannabinoids were given the name after Professor Mashula isolated and described delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol the main component of the, of the cannabis plant in the mid-1960s. Because the discovery was made during prohibition, this confined the growth of the science. Professor Mashulam, the grandfather of cannabinoid science, would also be involved in the discovery of the endocannabinoids, anandamide and 2-AG, with his students, postdocs, and collaborators. So uh, anandamide, the word, is taken from the, the Sanskrit word meaning supreme joy or bliss. The name 2-AG, 2-arachidinoglycerol, its synthesis is being described in the name. So in the, um, this, uh, this is a photo taken of Roger Federer. <laughs> um, he won Wimbledon this year, and he 
after he won Wimbledon, I remember him saying that it's not about lifting the trophy, it's about the process of being healthy. And endocannabinoids play a vital role in establishing and maintaining healthy cellular functioning and homeostasis. So what makes cannab endocannabinoids distinct? Endocannabinoids are lipids. The other neurotransmitters, as opposed to lipids, are either derived from amino acids, protein, or secondary metabolism. Cannabinoids don't function in water. They like to live and work in fat. Okay, so going back to my tennis analogy, anandamide is the umpire. The way I made this distinction, firstly, the umpire behaves like a regulator, controlling the game. Secondly, there is much more 2-AG than anandamide, like 200 times more. But this doesn't make anandamide any less important. 2-AG works by a point-to-point -point messenger system whereas anandamide is more of a local modulator. Both neurotransmitters are made on demand from a precursor signal and deactivated once they are no longer needed. Thirdly, in humans, one of the most rewarding experiences is social interaction. Anandamide is made in response to oxytocin produced in the hypothalamus. Oxytocin is the bonding hormone that is released during social contact. Anandamide is also important for implantation of the early stage embryo in its blastocyst form into the uterus. The same way the umpire initiates and controls proceedings in a tennis game. Anandamide is synthesized from something called NAPE, n arachidonyl phosphatidyl ethylamine and broken down by an enzyme called FAR, fatty acid amide hydrolase. In tennis, the signal for anandamide or the umpire to speak is the ball hitting the net. Anandamide delivers the score to the players with the fatty acid, transfer, with the fatty acid transporter. Then FAR ensures that the message is played only once and then it's deactivated. So 2AG are the ball boys and girls. They play an important role as a point-to-point -point retrograde messenger, sending balls or messages to each other, to, to the other ball girls, in order to get the ball back to the player. So in, when a neurotransmitter like glutamate or GABA binds to the postsynaptic receptors, they bind to a, a class of receptor called metabotropic receptors. Inside the metabotropic receptor is an enzyme called DGL, diglycerol lipase, which forms 2-AG only when metabotropic receptors are activated. 2-AG acts as a feedback messenger, relaying a message to the pre-terminal to the preterminal axon from the postsynaptic metabotropic receptor about activity in the postsynaptic neuron. The message is then recognized by another element called MGL, monoglycerol lipase. MGL finds the 2-AG and chops it up to, into inactive constituents, stopping 2-AG from, acti from activating the CB1 receptor. So 2-AG is a point-to-point -point retrograde messenger. After a player serves a fault into the net, this initiates a response, DGL, for the ball boy, which is 2AG, to run and collect the ball, initiating a process to return the ball back to the player, which is MGL, because the player doesn't want to keep getting ball sent at him, the pre-terminal axon, who will be well rested to fire a new action potential. So, in summary, anandamide behaves as a local modulator. 2-AG is working as a point-to-point -point retrograde messenger. Watching a tennis match, one can actually see that there are more people on the court helping the game than actually playing the, the game. Those are the endocannabinoids. Some even postulate 
that some of the more difficult to treat conditions are caused by something like an endocannabinoid deficiency, like fibromyalgia and migraine. So we know that people who use cannabis use for a variety of different reasons and experience the effects of cannabis quite consistently that you can see on my slide. Appetite simulation, pain relief, uh, memory, altered, altered memory, memory impairment, uh, creative thinking, and really a feeling and sense of connection to oneself and their environment. So phytocannabinoids, I'd like to compare them to the crowd. Uh, they are like the external influences on the match, raising the value of participation and reward. Phytocannabinoids are not broken down as rapidly as the endocannabinoids. One can compare the most important viewer, the most important spectator, the camera lens, to the most important phytocannabinoid, THC, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. It's the main psychoactive component of the plant. It's the one that gets you high. But cannabis contains at least 100 different cannabinoids. The other cannabinoids are biologically active, particularly one called CBD or cannabidiol has become quite popular and widely talked about for its ability to reduce seizures, protect us against cancer, and neuro neurodegenerative diseases. But actually, we have very little scientific information outside of THC. Those other cannabinoids all work together in what Arne described as well as the entourage effect, helping each other, balancing the over-intoxicating effects of THC. So how does THC work? Well, THC works by binding to cannabinoid receptors on the cell surface of mostly neurons, but also glial cells, combining with THC in a very selective manner. Glial cells are the cells that support the neurons. By combining with THC, they change conformation and initiate biochemical and physiological responses. And eventually, those responses lead to behavioral changes. Now, one of the most remarkable features of the CB1 receptor is that it's the single most concentrated, most abundant receptor in the brain. Out of interest, who here knew that? Who here knows that? Very few. <laughs> Some hands. Um, and I really like that quote. Abundance is something you really have to, is something we, it is not something we acquire. It is something we tune into. So what are knockout, ma what are knockout mice? Once scientists were able to clone the CB1 receptor, they could genetically alter mice to be absent with the receptor. When THC was given to these knockout mice, they found that because THC had nowhere to bind, there was no way to trigger any psychoactivity, proving definitively that THC works by activating specific cannabinoid receptors in the central nervous system. Now, fr uh, from the distribution and concentration of cannabinoid receptors, we can better understand the reproducible, predictable effects of THC. For example, in the basal ganglia, the CB1 receptor is 12 times more abundant than the opioid receptor and four times more abundant than the dopamine D2 receptor, which is extremely abundant in that region of the brain. Cannabis plays an inhibitory role on neurotransmitters in this region of the brain. This could explain why people who smoke cannabis tend to move slower or even drive slower, slower. And, and why cannabis is effective in managing symptoms of movement disorders like Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease. There are also high densities of CB1 receptors found in the cortex and the hippocampus, explaining the effects of cannabis on altering or impairing memory and its therapeutic potential 
for enhancing creativity, protecting us against diseases like Alzheimer's, and managing symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. The presence of CB1 receptors in the spinal cord and thalamus, regions involved in pain perception, explain why THC is effective in managing pain. The presence of CB1 receptors in the hypothalamus, an area of the brain responsible for certain metabolic processes like hunger and sleep, could account for the stimulation of appetite or sleep. There is not a single death recorded caused directly by the effects of cannabis intoxication because <laughs> because there's an absence of CB1 receptors in the lower brainstem, an area of the brain responsible for breathing, explaining why high doses of THC are not lethal. So originally, it was thought that CB1 receptor was expressed only in the, in the central nervous system and CB2 in the periphery, but both subtypes can be found throughout the body. Thank you to Cana Foundation for supplying this slide um, and our other Spanish sponsor, Pata Plant Research. Um, so in order to understand the effects of cannabis in the body, we can look at the concentration of where there is a high amount of cannabinoid receptors. CB1 receptors notably are found in the blood vessels. One frequent experience that particularly inexperienced users have is one of hypertension and anxiety in the initial stages of using cannabis. Hypertension is caused in large part by the activation of CB1 receptors in resistant vessels of the, blood, of the body. This causes hypertension. Because, because blood pressure is regulated by a sympathetic feedback and hypertension causes an increase in heart rate, that can have a psychological impact. Because when one senses a drop in blood pressure, and an increase in heart rate, one tends to experience fear. So a lot of the panic and fear that's associated with, uh, with cannabis in the early stages of use is linked to this physiological phenomenon. CB1 receptors are also found on peripheral neurofibers, specifically in the dorsal root ganglion, further implicating the role of cannabinoids in nociception and pain control, backed up by strong clinical evidence by people like Donald Abrams on the effectiveness of, of cannabis in treating peripheral neuropathy in people living with HIV. Cannabinoid receptors are also present in low but effective amounts in sensory fibers that innervate the lungs. There is evidence that the presence of CB1 receptors in the bronchial tree account for THC's bronchodilatory effect with implications in the management of diseases of the airway, like asthma. The white blood cells, the monocytes, leukocytes, and other cells of the innate immune system express both CB1 and CB2 receptors. The greatest densities of CB2 receptors can be found in the spleen, implicating their role in the immune function, but there's both receptors present, so that's why are still able to have immunity, immune function. So in summary, CB1 is truly ubiquitous because cells throughout the body express it. CB2 is not ubiquitous in a cell sense because only a few cell types express it. But it so happens that those cell types are found throughout the body. So to conclude, Science est uh, estimate the endocannabinoid system is millions of years old. Sea squirts, nematodes, and all vertebrate species evolved to share the endocannabinoid system as an essential part of life and adaptation. The cannabinoid receptors 
of the most abundant receptors in the human brain and are widespread throughout the body. Surely, it is time for us to start exploring the potential that cannabis offers us, not only as a medicine, but also for its many other uses, which probably outweigh its value as a drug. Ultimately, it doesn't matter if we can treat disease if we destroy the environment. Surely, it makes no sense to prohibit a plant from a medical sense that speaks to every aspect of our physiology. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thanks, Marlon. Thank <laughs> Thanks very much, Marlon, uh, for an elegant um, uh, explanation yeah. of the endocannabinoid system, uh, the <laughs> intricate system. Thanks. I hope that next time he gives us a talk, he'll use, instead of using the tennis analogy, he'll use the one about cricket, because <laughs> I still don't understand how it takes five days to finish a cricket match, and it's a draw. So thanks, Marlon. <laughs>